We want to look at the three disorders of water balance. I've started here with a picture showing the plasma, the interstitial space, and the intracellular space. Notice that you have equal concentration in all three co compartments. And I also drew in green here the proteins. Okay, the three disorders of water balance. These are going to be conditions that might occur if you have in not equaling out. So you want to have the same amount of water coming into the body as going out. So let's look at how, look at how water comes into the body. What is the source of water? Source of water for the body, main one people think of is that you drink water. You're drinking water, of course, that's going to take into account if, if, the, if that fluid is going to have alcohol in it, if it's going to have caffeine in it, um, but we want to kind of leave that out. We just, we're just basically saying, what are the sources of water? So we have water that you drink. We have water that's in food. And then you have a little bit of water made from catabolism. And those are the reactions in your body that are basically the opposite of digestion. Okay, out, water going out of your body. This is going to be water. How does it leave your body? Leaves the body. Body. Okay, water was going to be leaving the body through the skin, the integumentary system, feces through the digestive system. Water is going to be leaving um, with the air that you breathe, with the respiratory system, and then the urinary system. Okay, the three disorders of water balance are number one, dehydration. Number two, edema. And number three, hypotonic hydration. I believe this is probably going to be a two part video. Okay, first of all, let's look at dehydration. When does dehydration occur? Dehydration is going to occur whenever you have decreased water intake. That's going to be like you're not drinking enough water or anything that's going to increase the water leaving. This would include something like burns, severe burns. If you remember, skin is going to keep water in your body. So severe burns is going to cause the water to leave your body. Um, endocrine disorders. Endocrine disorders or would include diabetes. This would be diabetes, all three types, insipidus, type 1, and type 2 of mellitus. Um, it's going to include, oops, I don't know what that is, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, any, any type of stomach virus that causes that, you're more likely to be dehydrated. Profuse sweating. Um, bleeding. All of those are going to cause um, water to leave your body. Okay, what happens with dehydration? Let's look over here on our graph. Okay, on our graph here, we have all three of our compartments. Okay, whenever dehydration begins to occur, the plasma is going to decrease in water. Okay, there's not enough water in the plasma. Or there's not a normal amount of water in the plasma for whatever reason. So water is going to come from the interstitial space back into basically what it does is makes it makes the plasma more concentrated so water is going to leave the interstitial space and go into the plasma because of an increased osmotic pressure Do you remember how fluids going to move between those two spaces okay and then remember that water is going to move by osmosis um, between the interstitial space and the intracellular space so water is going to leave the cell and go into the interstitial space so what is the outcome of dehydration the outcome of dehydration is the cells do not have enough water, e -N -O -U -G -H, enough water so that they become hypertonic to what they normally should be. Okay, so that's what happens with dehydration. The symptoms of dehydration. Okay, the initial symptoms are the ones that you probably have heard of anyway. Initial symptoms, you're thirsty. Dry mouth, yellow urine, 
decreased urine output, and the skin can be flushed, dry flushed skin. Long term, this isn't talking about three years, but this is saying a few hours. Um, you have weight loss. If you lose 3% of your body weight in water, you are dehydrated. Uh, fever, mental confusion, headache, and basically what basically what um, the whole thing that um, is going to affect your body is that you don't have enough water for circulation, decreased water for circulation. And if y'all remember that blood volume determines blood pressure, what, what do you think um, another one would be on here? Everybody agree decreased blood pressure because of lack of blood volume. Okay, so um, let's erase some of this for dehydration and let's go to edema. Okay, edema is commonly what we call swelling. And in edema, okay, edema is typically what we call swelling. And the fluid in edema, since this is number two, edema is excess fluid in the interstitial space. Okay, so what happens whenever fluid increases in this interstitial space here? Whenever you increase the size of the interstitial space, it's going to get larger, and it's going to take longer for molecules to go from the interstitial space into the cell, and those waste products that were made by the cell that are supposed to diffuse into the interstitial space, they're still going to be in the interstitial space, and it inhibits their movement to the plasma. So there's excess fluid in the interstitial space and that inhibits movement of nutrients to the cell and waste products to leave the cell so that they can go into the plasma and be carried out of the body. Okay, the edema is going to be caused by, um, it's actually several things, but a lot of them can just be classified as this. Anything that increases the hydrostatic pressure and anything that decreases osmotic pressure. Okay, so some, what are some things that are, can increase the hydrostatic pressure? Remember the hydrostatic pressure? You have your capillary here and push this out. Remember hydrostatic pressure is a result of the blood pressure. So anything that increases the blood pressure is going to increase the hydrostatic pressure. Another thing that's going to increase the hydrostatic pressure is if you have these blood vessels here that this capillary is supposed to be emptying into, if they have any type of blockage in them, then that's going to cause the, the blood to back up into the capillary. So blockages, and that commonly is going to be a blood clot. Remember that the valves in your veins are going to help move the blood. So the valves, valve damage, in the veins is going to cause edema. Um, if the right side of the heart, if the right side of the heart is damaged, it's not able to push the blood out towards the lungs, and so the blood's going to back up in the vena cavas and in those larger veins, and you get the results in the capillary, so that's going to give systemic edema. That results in systemic edema. If the left side of the heart is weakened, then the blood backs up into the lungs and that's going to give someone pulmonary edema. So those are several reasons there for an increase in hydrostatic pressure. Osmotic pressure, um, well, we're, osmotic pressure is going to be caused by less molecules. Remember, here's your capillary and osmotic pressure would push the water in because of osmosis. A big player here for osmotic pressure are these plasma proteins. So the most common reason for a decrease in plasma proteins, I mean, decrease in osmotic pressure is a decrease in plasma proteins. Okay, 